Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Steph Pogson. I'm a software consultant um, at HBP in Cameron and um, work closely with our sales and operations teams to ensure that kind of the right solutions implemented for our customers. So the point, um, the kind of purpose of today is it's not going to be death by PowerPoint. Um, I just want to do a brief introduction about Business Cloud and why we choose this as a solution and how it stacks up against other solutions. Set out some expectations I want to show you in a bit more detail. Show you the product and how it meets those requirements. And then hopefully we'll have had some questions throughout the presentation. Should be a little Q&A box that you can pop questions through to me in. Um, and I'll do my best to answer them at the end, or I'll take them away and get the answers for you if we run out of time. So let's start by setting the scene of expectations. This is always the first step in our sales cycle. We always go through in detail the requirements of a business and learn more about you before we start talking about product. Because this is a demo system, um, we'll just refer to the business as our manufacturing business. Um, but these aims, goals, values, whatever you want to call them, they're pretty much the same um, for all businesses. They're what drives success, sustainability, and ultimately profitability. Um, so before we look at Business Cloud, I think it's important to look at how systems work and how Business Cloud differs from this. When we talk about traditional software systems, be that Sage, Exchequer, or Pegasus to kind of um, name a few. They rely on a server for the application and perhaps for the database as well. Some will say they are cloud based. But what that can actually mean is that you just don't have your servers on site um, in the corner of your office or your server in wherever they may be. You effectively have the same thing in the cloud. You have infrastructure held somewhere that this program sits on and you then access it. Or it may mean that some of the system is accessible through the cloud, and that could be a shared website pulling data out or a reporting tool that extracts information and is publishable on the web. But what we need to, as a means of accessing our data is um, a Windows based machine to do it. All of these applications are generally Windows based. Um, and that could be a PC, it could be a remote desktop server, in which case we would have to also then have perhaps VPNs, secure certificates, another server, another set of licensing just to be able to get the data we want to. And usually with the traditional system, we find that that's just the challenge, not only the challenge around the account system and, and the data that that holds, but the companies have probably evolved and, and that they already have other systems or they'll have had other systems and implemented account systems. So perhaps they've got um, a payroll system or they're outsourcing that. There's a CRM product that gets some information from the accounts but can't view the bill of materials information for accounts. There's always a lot of spreadsheets around the central accounting system and, and processes allowing businesses to run their business. And quite often there's multiple versions of the truth, local copies of the inventory list on two or three machines, critical information being a, kind of tracked in Excel spreadsheets. And please don't take from that that we're going to stop using Excel. It's a fantastic tool and it's, when it's used well, it complements the system and it's brilliant for what it does. And inevitably, as we've mentioned, all of that stuff, all of that information and data and silos we like to call them in, in industry um, will have some sort of IT and that could be one or multiple servers on one or multiple sites and locations just to manage them. And that inevitably means a considerable amount of complexity. There'll be a number of versions of the truth why we talked about inventory spreadsheet or the traceability sheets been printed out in production but there's a more up-to-date copy on the ops manager's desktop or even in SharePoint. And a lot of time spent pulling this information together from different silos, typically at the month end or beyond, after everything's happened, so that we can have a look at what our cash flow looks like or 
pull a load of reports together, to analyse the information, to post the journal, to correct the facts. Just really wasting a lot of time and creating a lot of churn of information and a lot of stress and headache typically as well. So taking those requirements in mind that we looked at briefly around being a bit smarter, improving cash flow, making people generally happier about using the systems and tools we give them. When we go back and look at our manufacturer, what do they need to do to overcome that complexity and achieve what they want to and when they need to? Well, we need a way to simplify things like traceability and communication around the wider business, sharing information in a better way. We need to be able to gain quicker insight into what's happening with the business now so we can make more proactive decisions and rather than react to challenges that as they come up. And most of all, we want something that will grow and evolve with us because we don't want to get back to this situation again in a year, two years, five years time, however long that, that cycle of review is. So we looked at the traditional cloud deployment where traditional cloud, traditional software deployment, sorry, where we've got a server and we're accessing it in some way. And that could be over the internet through the cloud. But unlike traditional software, the way advanced business cloud works, it's a true cloud deployment. The product and processing power is all held in a data center and is accessed over the internet through a browser. And that's any browser on any device. If you don't need a Windows based machine or a specific browser, we can um, be on a beach, sat watching TV at home, on the factory floor, in the office, accessing it how we want, when we need to. So I'm today going to use Chrome on the laptop because I'm in the office. Last night I used Safari on my iPad. So we're, we can kind of do what we need to. The benefits of business cloud over traditional systems is it's a unified system. It's a single system designed for manufacturing. When we post an invoice on a customer account, that's forming the debtors ledger. There's no rekeying or transferring of that information to make up the account. It's recorded live. So more importantly, that means when we're capturing costing information, we're capturing it in the right place at the right time. Things like goods received not invoice, which happen at the end of the month traditionally, or accruals and quick payments, happen when we raise the purchasing transactions that generate. It means then we can get a more informed view of cash flow, we can make smarter decisions, look at scheduling, and we'll see all that in the demonstration. As we mentioned, it's cloud. So not only can I get it from any device anywhere, when my engineer or my installer on site receives goods, they can record the fact they've received them. I don't have to wait for them to fish a delivery note out the footwell of their van and bring it into me at the end of the month. Or do a month end stock check of that van stock to see what product they've consumed. They can record it when it happens. And more importantly, where it differs from traditional software systems, this has been written by manufacturers for manufacturers. But it also does the VAT return, the payroll, produces the P&L takes away the headache, a lot of those accounting processes, because it's being driven when the data happens. So, shall we have a look at it? As I mentioned, I'm using Business Cloud today on Chrome, um, and I'm gonna log in as an admin user. So we've got full access to the system. But user access and controls are really simple and straightforward. We can give users different levels of access, and we actually have two types of users. We have effectively four users that are processing users who maybe need to do one or two things throughout the system. And then we also have um, light users, but these could be people who just want to capture the consumption of parts or do goods received or just capture time in production. When I log into Business Cloud, what it alerts me to are things I need to know about. So I've got a couple of methods of alert I've got at the top here awaiting processing to their actions I need to take. And down here, alerts from the software itself. So was there an update last night? Is there a release coming? The software's updated 
and videos are provided through the portals so that you can have a look at them when they happen, choose whether you start using those functions, taking the headache away of having to have system updates and controls. I can see we've got some due events. They're going to be around our CRM system. So I'll come back to those because I'm going to have a look at our forecast and pipeline today so I can make sure those activities are up to date. The system will alert me to other things as well. So these could be recurring invoices that need posting or, or payments that need to be actioned. Or in this case, that we've got some stock going below minimum. But I can click through from the dashboard and have a look at what items the system's considering I need to look at. And I'm going to be running my MRP today. So while these some of these stock items aren't run out of stock yet, they are getting quite low. But I need to see if my demand within production affects these and do I need to think about doing something with them to get the most um, from my ordering power. Additionally, what the system does is it provides me with the graphical information of what I need to know about. So I'm a very production focused person. I can see that we've planned all our production up to Friday, but today is my day for planning next week's production, or it could be stretched out further depending on how we work. I can have a look at our sales order productivity. There's a number of matrices and KPIs that I can capture to look at when I log into the system to present me with the things that matter to me. Users can tailor these themselves and get the information they need, and we can drill into further information, such as our overdue orders, by clicking through into a more specific set of information and statistics relating to that business area. We talked about briefly um, with something like Sage or Exchequer that we would have to perhaps have a secondary CRM system and a separate payroll and things like that. So what we're going to have a look at now is how, by having this unified system, we can capture the information right at the start of a sales cycle and feed that information through to the team in the various stages of that transaction's journey um, through our business. Now, we're not going to sit here and we'll key in lots of information, but what I have done is kind of given us some information that we can process and also some information we can look at from an accounting and production perspective. So I have um, various things I want to look at, but let's start with CRM. CRM is both pre and post sale with Business Cloud. It integrates in contacts across the wider business. So these can be suppliers, customers. They can be contacts within prospects. Once somebody orders from me, they become a customer, but they still sit in my CRM system and the traceability of that transaction doesn't go away. I've got opportunities, so these could be pre-sale, these could be additional opportunities within my customer base, and I can choose how I analyse those and I can segregate my data up. I've then got post-sale activity, so complaints processes, support tickets, I can track warranty, I can associate assets with customers. But we're going to have a look at this from a very top level today. Within my opportunities, I've set mine up with quite a simple pipeline process, but some people need this to be more complex. And it is something you can set up yourself. So I've got various statuses that my opportunities go through, and that defaults the percentage forecast to them. So that allow, and I can override that. That allows me then to produce things like a prospect report, important for a sales manager to know that his team's performing, but equally important for the production team to know that do we have some demand coming? It's going to put a big drag on our production processes. So I can choose when I run this for. I can scale it back because from a production point of view, I'm much more interested in the coming month, whereas sales managers may be looking at the coming quarter. I can look at what the weighted average is and what those values look like. And actually, have there been any quotes generated against them and what they look like too? So it could be a quote's been raised, but it's already been ordered. And it's an ongoing opportunity because maybe I track it post sale as well. 
I could drill into my opportunities and quotes and look at information in more detail. This is really where we're starting to see the traceability that's available within Business Cloud. I can see straight away from this screen where their opportunities have had quotes associated with them, what the average value of those opportunities are, because this could be recurring orders, and what's happening. So let's have a look at our quote from Heather Meadows. Heather's our contact within an organisation who aren't actually a customer yet. So this is where I'm linking into my prospects. I can see what the purpose of that was. I can add custom fields to track things like where they heard from us from so that we can get an analysis of actually the value and success of opportunities based on our different marketing streams. I can see all the events and activity that's happened in order to get this opportunity to where it is now. And I can attach files and documents that are relevant to this opportunity that are then held centrally within the business cloud environment. I can click through into the quote that this opportunity has generated. And I can even take that from an initial estimate and track revisions if I want to as well. So within my quote, I can see who it's for. I can see the opportunity it's associated with. I can record the payment terms that I've agreed so that when this becomes an order, that information is passed straight away to our finance team. And I can even control at what stage payment has to have been completed in order for my goods to be dispatched to my customer. So if we're dealing with things like main contract discounts or retentions, this is really important. And I can track those retentions and when those due dates are on those payments right from day one of getting that quote from the system. Line by line, I can track what due date this call off order in this case has. And I can even choose default notes and information that I want to pass through to the team. It may be that I want to communicate different delivery addresses or I want to um, adjust the profit probability of the actual quote itself rather than just the overall opportunity. I can have documents pre-set up, document library notes pre-set up that drop on to my opportunity and capture delivery addresses and store those against customer records. If I'm not using MRP or not using it to its fullest, perhaps I deal with completely unique one-off builds. I want to automatically, when this gets confirmed as an order, generate all of the works orders that are associated with it. I can do that. I can also generate any required purchases. So if this is made of unique items that I don't normally hold in stock, I can do that. But what I want to look at today is how we can take all of this information to do with demand and feed it into our operational system. So let's have a look at how we convert that quote into an order effectively. I can see at the moment we've got no customer details there. So I can quickly and easily confirm as order. That converts that quote to an order, but alerts me that I don't have a customer associated with it as yet. So this is a brand new prospect that's coming to me. I could have made an error and actually choose to um, create um, a contact link at this point, that's what we'll do. So Catherine actually um, works for my customer air pressure alignments. I can now go back into my quote. I can see that's refreshed and updated and I can confirm it as an order. I could give this opportunity a description if I wanted to. So increased FY21. Just gives me a way of being able to search and find that again in future, that traceability. 
I could adjust any quantities I need to or the due dates. But if I'm happy with everything, I can choose to save and send an order acknowledgement to my customer if I wanted. I can reconfirm that payment schedule, change any of the dispatch stages that I need to, simply update it. And that's passed all of that information that I captured on that quote straight through into the business cloud system. What I can also do from a CRM perspective and from a production perspective is forecast demand. So I've done a review of my CRM and I'm actually expecting an order to come in from Bridge M Plastics. I can track which products that's going to affect the demand of, when it's going to affect it. And when I do my MRP process later, I can take that into account. So if I've got long lead times on getting stock in, or I've got a really busy production period because of the seasonality of my business, I can drag that information into production and it'll mean I can get a much more smarter view of what's going on. Particularly important when we're looking at cash flow and so on. Okay, so let's have a look at what information goes into those items that are on our quotes and sales orders. Items can be added on the fly, so as we're creating a quote or an order, we can create a new stock item. We can copy existing bills of materials and adjust them. Or we can just create straight stock items in the system. So what we're going to do it today is um, have a look at just stock. We want to just filter for manufactured stock that's not obsolete. So we can get revisions of products very easily into the system by copying an existing build, giving it a revision reference to the stock code and obsoleting the original design. I'm also going to just look at frying pans because that's what we've got in our demo data. I can use those custom fields as well that we talked about earlier to slice and dice up the information. So if it's important for me to know, is it a featured product on my website perhaps? So I want to keep a track of what the movements look like with those. As we saw when we logged into the system initially, I'm then alerted to the key information about this product. So I can see that we've got 143 in stock, but actually we have got a, um, a lot of demand there that's going to make that stock go negative. And that's where we're going to have a look at our MRP and see what's happening with this item. We have a look into a product. I'm going to focus on the stainless product ranges today and have a look at how this is made up. Standard stock information, because this is one of our manufactured products um, on, the, on the left. And we'll come back to the right when we look at a bought in item. So stock codes, descriptions, the uniqueness of a product. We can extend out that description and, and give more description to print on transactional documents. Track our pricing and margin for our product. And that margin could be made up of a number of elements. So in this case, it's a built item. So it's being made up um, by material cost and labour cost, but we can also take into account subcontracted costs. And it's made up of a number of processes. Well, we could see there that actually that labour cost is a little different to what we're seeing here. And the reason for that, if I just pop into edit and look at our manufacture tab, that labour is actually analysed based on an economic batch quantity. I've told the system that when I need to make some of this, I need to make a thousand, else it's just not cost effective. I can track the components that are required within the individual item, and then the time required for the process as a batch as a whole. But as I can see there, this unit cost is higher than the labour cost involved in this product, and that's because it's made up of other assemblies. So as we saw with the drilling and the traceability through from a quote to an order or an opportunity, I can very much do the same thing back to a resource to see its availability. 
or into individual components within a build and that assembly item. So I can check my resource availability and costs and labour rates from here, attach any drawings or setup processes that are required for a piece of machinery, take it offline from a planning perspective and adjust its hours if I want to. Within a sub-assembly, we've then got the same processes. We've got our component stocks and what they look like and our different processes that make it up. So we can see there's a lot more labour involved in making the base compared to just putting the lid and the base together. But the principles are the same. If I drill down again and look at the stock item, a final item that's available, I can track which suppliers I want to buy that from what their unit of measure looks like. So perhaps if I'm dealing in rolls of material, I get a whole hundred meter roll into stock from a supplier, but I actually stock it in meters and manage it in meters, or I buy it in, in kilos, sell it out in grams, stock it in five kilos, however I need to control a system. Pricing can then be in currency or sterling and the system will calculate that back. And it will record and track my lead times for me. And all of this information together with those sales orders, the works orders, the forecast, that's all driving my demand in my operations. And the information's flowing through the system without me having to do a great deal. So I've already got some work scheduled, but I know I need to do my MRP process to see what I need to do over the next week or so. So let's have a look. Within our MRP, what this is going to do, it's going to take into account what I tell it to. So defaultly, it's looking at the next month production. That's great, but I'm a little bit more interested in knowing what's happening up to the end of next month. Let's filter it down to a weekly view just so it's a little bit nicer for me to look at. And I could just look at specific stock locations if I build things in different areas of the business. I can change my sort to look at what's going to go under quantity. And I can see that I've obviously done a bit of forward planning here because I've looked at my demand previously and I've made when I had a lull in production. But I've now got a situation where I'm going to go under minimum stock based on the current sales orders in the system. But when I'm looking at the overall plan, I actually need to look at that forecast as well, because Phil's told me when he's communicated kind of the sales team's information that we are going to have some demand from from bridge end that's going to affect production as well so while we're overstocked at the moment um that that stock level is going to get depleted quite quickly based on those orders the system then gives me two types of alert i've got a red alert that is something that's going to cause production to halt it could be that it's built stock that i've not built enough of or it could be components going out of stock within the timeframes I've set. I also get amber alerts. Amber alerts are products which are going to go below a measure. So in this case, below my 500 minimum stock that I've said I always want to keep in. But I don't have any demand up to the end of February that's going to cause a problem. I stretch this out by another month. Um, is this going to come further? No, we're fine. Do I want to react on the 15th of January and buy stock that's not going to be affected until the end of February? Well, I know from experience that these products take a few days to come in, but we're not talking weeks. So we can make a decision on what we need to do with those in a second. When we come to kind of fulfill that demand, we can get the system to do that for us. I don't have to sit and rekey purchase orders or works orders. I can change what I want to do that for. So I only want to plan production to the end of the month. I can choose to only look at purchase orders or only look at works orders for a specific location or multiple suppliers. However, I want to do that. So I'll choose to calculate. The system then takes into account that batch quantity. So if it thinks I need to, in our case here, make a quantity to get me back up to minimum stock, so make 32. It's going to tell me to make a thousand or it's going to tell me to make a hundred, five hundred, whatever that batch quantity is. 
I get the same alerts as well. So if I'm not able to get something in on time, the system will alert me. And the system knows what it knows. We have people within business that can then make decisions based on this information, but it's presenting you with the facts and allowing you to decide what to do with them, rather than you having to go and run three spreadsheets and two reports to get those facts to make that decision. I'm going to focus on our 12 inch stainless pans today, but we'll just create a couple of works orders. We're going to choose to create our purchase orders and we can add those into our planned production and then review each in turn if we wanted to. Quickly create my orders and then I get a choice when we're dealing with our purchasing, what, we, what do we want to happen? So if my suppliers will only fulfill complete purchase orders, I could choose to consolidate them into one PO send that to my supplier and they'll send me the lines in a batch or I could send off individual purchase orders and I will get them fulfilled when I want to each with different due dates. I can also override those quantities so actually I know I'm probably going to need to order 10 of that rather than six the system says and perhaps I don't need 84. But I can make inquiries against the stock and drill into the information about other areas of the business or start again, change the due dates, whatever I need to do. So my quote has now become a sales order that's then generated my works orders and generated my purchase order. So I can see that my long term production view is looking pretty good, but we've not scheduled everything we need to. When we have a look at our scheduling, this takes into account those resources we looked at, what their availability defaultly is, so what operational hours do they have, how many manning hours do they need, etc. The system presents me with works orders that have not yet been scheduled at the top, and I could have lots of works orders sat there and filter it down to only show me things that need to be scheduled up to certain dates. I can drop them into my existing production plan, which is looking a little messy, so we'll come back to that as well. I can reschedule within here, and the system's designed to be intelligent and it knows what can happen following the rules we've set out. So if we've told the system that something goes through cutting then pressing then assembly, we can't move the assembly process before the sheet steel has been cut, for example. I can set up, have set up and cool down time. So for things like CNC machines where programs have to be loaded. And I can rearrange my work schedule. So it's a little bit unproductive that at the moment we've got this huge gap in production and we've got work wrapping over onto a second day. So I could just pull those processes together. But if I try and overlap them, the system knows it can't do two processes at the same time. So we only have one man on that machine. I could extend out the working day a little bit because at the moment they're starting at eight and finishing around three in final assembly. But on this particular day, it'd be much more useful if they stayed till four and got that work done for me. I can track subcontracted schedules as well. So I can record setup and processing time for my subcontractors, generate purchase orders to them when I generate my works orders or when I plan my production. So that again, that information is feeding through to the right people in the right places. But I can rearrange and reschedule my production as I need to. And that drops into my plan and I'm able to have a look at the overall works order views within the business there. Okay. We talked before um, and kind of briefly mentioned about our users being able to access information live on the shop floor. 
So we can look at our works orders as traditional works order lists. And if we want to print job cards and labels and hand bits of paper around, and that is necessary for some businesses to still follow those processes, but capture the information in the system. But the ideal situation is that we've built this schedule, we've done our planning, we've got our materials in place. What we want to do is provide our staff with a mechanism to capture the information when it happens, show that production started when it starts, when it stops, capture notes to say that things have happened when they've happened and how they should have happened. So we do this through the live process view. This is an area of the system that somebody could be what we class as a light user and they only have access to this. So I could be sat in the office as the production manager and this could be up on a wall board showing me where each individual works order is in my stages. If there isn't an edit button to the right, that means that there's a process preceding that one and that has to finish before the next process can start. And I can also see my previous works orders that have been completed. When I'm looking on the shop floor, I can filter this down just to a specific process. So if I filter down to my hydraulic press, I can see that there's processes that have to happen within the cutting team before I can do that. Come back to my cutting team. I can see what work I've already started and I can choose to complete it and track material and so on. So I'm performing an inspection. I just want to check something. I can capture that time. If I'm performing a build, it will present me with the components it's expecting to use and what I've already tracked, I've used. I can record notes. And I can capture when those processes have finished and completed. Once I've completed a process at the, in a couple of clicks, that job then removes from my to do list and it goes on to the hydraulic press stage. It shows me based on my filter what work I've done and we can see the time that it's taken to do it. Catching that information live and when it happens means it doesn't get forgotten. It also means that I'm getting a true visibility of what's happening within my business and ultimately means I can get a performance report once the works orders have been completed, including any variance around the hours needed and actual costs. Manufacturing variance is something that's very difficult to track with some systems until things have happened completely. And then equally, we have journals to post into the system. All of this information is posted back into the system. Similarly, when somebody's out on site and the materials turn up or they arrive at the back door, a user could just be given access to create goods received. There's no purchase order reference against it but I know that it's come from Worcester Steel stockholders, or it's a specific stock item, or even down to a PO. But I'm going to search and find my orders that are outstanding for that supplier. Could be that it's none of these things and it's just a product that's turned up. That happens um, and we need to be able to track that. We need to track the cost of that. But in my case, I'm going to say everything's arrived. I can capture the batch numbers of materials and they could be my internal ones or those provided by my supplier. I can capture expiry and quality and condition as custom fields and make things mandatory or not if I want to. This is important where you are receiving goods in and then storing them and something happens to that product after it's been received. I can choose to create back orders as well and also accept over delivery of products so that then when the purchase invoice arrives, I've already dealt with that information and tracked and recorded details.
what happens in the background within Business Cloud, as I touched on during the PowerPoint, is that actually then generates me instantly my goods receipt, not invoice journal in my accounts. If I were to record a purchase invoice for my telephone bill, I could track the period that that line rental relates to and record the prepayment automatically. I don't have to worry about posting those kind of month's end transactions. I can just have a look at them. So within my goods receipt, not invoiced here, if I have a look at the activity of that account, I can see my material purchases and goods received, when they've happened and how they've happened. I can sort this, I can filter it. I've got those same advanced search functions, even in the accounting that I had elsewhere. As the accountant, I can have a look and say, gosh, that's a pretty big GRNA figure. I've not had my invoice yet at month end. What does it made up of? I can see which supplier it is. Yeah, they always are late sending their invoices. I'm happy that that GRNI is going to sit there. Don't have to worry about chasing the invoice. I know when it's going to arrive. But again, is that traceability. I can see the information about the items, where they came from, what batch numbers were made up, what other products came in on that delivery if there was a problem with the delivery. I can, within my accounts, then get manufacturing reports live. So I can find out what's happened this month rather than last month from a business performance perspective. I can find out what I need to know about my projects if I deal with projects and tenders. What do my variances look like? Is there a production variance I need to look into? Highlighting that information when we need to see it. Okay. So, Apologies, just popped my window back up then. So, did we meet that business need? Did we take into account what they wanted to do? They wanted a way to simplify things. They wanted to simplify communication, data sharing, reduce rekeying. Well, we definitely did that. We've got that integrated CRM within Business Cloud, forecasting and MRP being pulled together, allowing us to choose to generate back-to-back -back orders or just convert different transaction types. We're looking at one version of the truth that we can then proactively plan from. We've got that unified ledger, so when I'm looking at my cash flow, I know what those transactions are. It takes into account my VAT. It takes into account my goods received, my invoice, and I can make it. So I'm able to provide our financial and operations team better performance reporting, better information sharing, by looking at those upcoming and post-sale processes, we can provide a more fluid and traceable system, being able to get back to detail about a transaction that happened three years ago and what the chain looked like to do that. Was it worth us going after those types of opportunities and do we want to relook at that marketing activity again? And capturing that information when it matters really does mean we can make better decisions. This was a brief overview, obviously, today. But hopefully you can see from the options that are within the menu that this system gives you the ability to adapt and, and control more things. We can add quality control. We can add complaint processes. We can deliver the users information that need to see it rather than anybody across the business just keeping their little silo to themselves. So hopefully that's shown you what you need. If you haven't popped any questions into the chat window, please do so now. We've got kind of 10, 15 minutes left if anybody's got anything they want to look at. I'm just going to jump back to my chat window and see if there's any questions there. Okay, that's a good, yeah, that's a really good question actually. Um, one of the questions that's there in the chat window, thank you for sending that in by the way, um, was around batch control. So we could see there what showed you was that we could batch control, we could have our own batch numbers or we could have serial numbers. Um, the question is, could we have both? Absolutely. It's a free tech, the free text fields for a start, so you kind of put what you want into them. Uh, but what you can do is segregate that up. So I we saw this quite, uh, quite recently with someone who um, received a product team where it was the same batch of an item, 
but then there was a chemical traceability number. So absolutely, you can have both. Can I generate my own? Can I generate my own? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there's a couple of different ways you can generate sales invoices, and we've, we've kind of not touched on that side of the financials. Um, the support tickets system allows me to produce billable time. So, um, and against my employees in my payroll, I can have recharge rates and things as well. Absolutely, that's probably something we want to look at. Okay. So, hopefully, that's shown everybody what they needed to see today from Business Cloud. But obviously, the team are always here to answer any questions. Um, please feel free to fire them through, and we'll do do our best to answer them. Um, or get in touch to have a look at something in more detail. We we'll end the presentation there, unless anybody's got any other questions. Um, hopefully, that's given you what you need to see. Um, and um, I look forward to hopefully meeting some of you in the future. Look at this in more detail. Thank you. <laughs>